Hi, I'm Jessica Rector, your host and founder of This Man Thing, where we help men be a truer, better versions of themselves and stand in their unique power to gain more freedom, confidence, and success. You can find us at thismanthing.com. You can also join our free Facebook group at thismanthing.com forward slash groups, where men are having real conversations and building much needed community support and camaraderie with other men. Jeff Bowman is a father, author, and experienced financial leader. He is the founder and creator of the Your Income, Your Life methodology and coaches parents around the world on personal finance. His purpose is to equip all parents with the tools they need to achieve their goals and model something different to their kids. Welcome, 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 Jeff. It's such a pleasure to have you here. Thanks very much, Jessica. I'm honored to be a part of your show. Um, I, I just want to start by saying, you know, one of the, the things that I noticed when I went into your Facebook community is the reason why you created this group and um, your passion behind it. I can relate to almost everything that you have on there. It was like you were talking to me when you wrote those words. So I, I'm honored to be here and I'm, I'm happy to have this conversation with you today. Oh, well, that's so nice to hear. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's really wonderful to hear. I mean, I don't know wonderful in the aspect of that you that all that resonates, but but I guess it's a good thing. So yay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's awesome. something we all we awesome. all can resonate with, right? I mean, yeah. um, the important thing is that we can talk about it, and that's what a lot of people struggle with is having that ability to talk with others and go through and share their issues so that we can actually overcome them. When in many cases in society, people you know keep them inside, and and it creates a whole different world of anxiety for them. So. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good thing to have a forum where people can openly talk and share their struggles and build on the strengths of others. Yes, I'm into that. And I think one of the places where men may feel that resistance, resistance that anxiety, that stress is in their finances, right? And that's what we're going to kind of get into today. And that's also really kind of a taboo topic you know, to talk about your finances, you know, how much money you make or don't make. Um, like how much you have set aside for retirement or your college, uh, college for your kids or any of those things. It's kind of taboo. And a lot of times when things are taboo, it's, um, it makes people more insecure to talk about them. And then, you know, men are great at uh, pushing them down and numbing them and ignoring them, which just kind of allows them to all fester. So tell us how you got started along, uh, along this journey, along this path of helping people with this. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you 100% in that money in society today is, is extremely taboo. And that's one of my goals is to try to help people overcome that. Um, you know, when I look back over my life and all of the tough times I had, um, despite having a background in finance, I made so many mistakes in those difficult times in my life that weren't related to money um, with money as a result, if that makes sense. So if I give you an example, right, when I dealt with uh, my first major uh, relationship ending, the reaction I had to that was to go out and spend a whole bunch of money because, you know, I thought that instant gratification would make me feel better and would solve all my problems. And then only to realize several months later that it created a whole new set of problems. And every time I went through one of those situations, I kind of reacted in the same way. Mm. And eventually I was able to break that pattern, uh, but it took me a long time to get there because like you said, money is so taboo. You know, when you compare, you look at social media today and everybody's comparing all the good things in their life, which is wonderful. It's, it's amazing to see that there's so many good things happening in people's lives, but because of that, they don't necessarily always want to talk about or share the things they're struggling with. And, you know, when I went through and did my research on the topic, a couple of interesting things I found, right? First and, and foremost, when I went out to the experts to try to fix my finances, when I finally realized that and admitted that I had a problem, what I felt like was that um, they're actually yelling at me. Mm. So, you know, they were telling me all the negative things that I had done and why I, all the mistakes I'd made. And it was like I was reliving it over and over again. Instead of just talking to me in a way that said, you're human. You know, we all make these mistakes and there's certainly some things you can do. You've done well. And how do we build on those strengths to, to create something better moving forward? And that was the one thing I was missing. So it was taboo. 
and people didn't talk about it. And the second thing was when people did talk about it, it was all negative. But you know, also if people talk to you like that, when you're trying to go and get help and get guidance and change something, when people talk to you like that, it pushes you into shame. And guess what? It's not going to make you want to come out and get help when it comes back up again or if you find yourself in this situation. Or it's not going to find you resonating with that person. And then you're going to be scared because it's a shame to go out and talk to somebody else about it. Absolutely. I agree 100%. Right. So when I deal with clients today, what usually happens in our first conversation is they tell me about all the things they've done wrong. And, and you know, you can hear the guilt and anxiety and, and dependence they have on money, but they're not in a position where they're um, ready to move forward, right? And they've heard all those messages from outside. And, and it's just kind of sitting and weighing heavily on them instead of hearing, look at, you, look at the things you've done well. If we pull from this, you know, and, and apply it to this part of your life, we could really create some momentum quickly. So sometimes people just need to hear that you're doing some things well. Yeah. Build on those instead of talking about all the things that you've done poorly. That is so important. I think that goes in any aspects of our lives, right? That sometimes, I mean, we're so easy at picking ourselves apart and finding out all the bad things. But yet when it comes to saying, okay, what have I done well? Um, what's good about this? What have I learned? Like anything like that, it's so hard for us to pick those up and, and to really cherish and champion ourselves for those things and not say, well, I did that well, but... Well, and then everything else, as soon as you say, but it negates everything you did well, right? And, and you start focusing on all the things that you didn't do, didn't do. And then that, okay, well, I should have known. Why didn't I know? You know, how was I not taught this? Like those kind of things come up in our heads. Yeah. And I think the other part too, is that when people sometimes start talking about the things that they've done wrong, um, they're quickly judged by others, mm -hmm. right? So, so I'll give you an example. When, when my wife and I went through um, part of our transformation, I like to call it, uh, one of the things that we did is we realized we had a whole bunch of stuff in the basement that we'd bought, things mm -hmm. that we bought in the past that we thought would make us happy, that we're now just sitting in the basement. And um, we wanted to do a trip with our kids, and we said, well, how are we going to afford this right now? And we started cleaning out the basement and ended up selling you know, almost everything that was sitting in that back room. And the response that I got was surprising from other people, right? They started to joke and make fun of me and, and my wife in terms of, well, the next thing you're going to do is sell your kids and you're selling everything and they would laugh. And I, I just kept thinking to myself is if this is how other people are responded to when they act responsibly with their money, yes. what is that doing for us as a society on a whole? And, and as men, here's the important thing, right? Is we, what I found is that men attach finances to their ego. Mm, ooh, tell me more about that. Yeah, so, so women are generally in a place where their finances are a source of security for them. They're a source of certainty. Whereas men, it, 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 it is directly related to the ego they have and their self-worth. So mm. when they hear they're not doing things well with money, it's like a blow to the chest right off the bat, right? What do you mean I'm not providing for my family? What do you mean I'm not successful? They hear all these things and they associate it with their own self-worth. And what I'm trying to make people realize is that it, it doesn't need to be that way, right? And when people talk together as couples, recognizing as a woman and talking to your husband, if you talk to him in a way that makes him feel like he hasn't accomplished the things he's supposed to, he's naturally going to react negatively yes. in this conversation and vice versa, right? So if a man talks to his wife in a way that makes her feel that they don't have security or hey, I'm going to go quit my job and I'm going to do this and we're going to make a whole bunch of money because that's attached to his ego. The, the wife in that situation starts to feel panic and anxiety. So I really try to help people understand that you know, when we let go of the ego and we let go of the reasons why we want this security blanket, what we can do is build on the strengths within each, each person in that relationship and really start to create momentum and, and, and foster something positive moving forward. I mean, I, I dealt with a client the other day where um, the husband, when I talked to them, said, yeah, I have no worries about money at all, you know? And, and his, his wife was saying, yeah, but I, I want to make sure we have this and I want to make sure we have this and I feel anxiety every day. And I said, so how do we pull, you know, his feelings of um, a stress-free free life as it relates to money 
and your feelings of anxiety and leverage both of those because they're both equally important. So how do you do so, that? Um, how do I do that is I go through with my clients an exercise as it relates to their values and their purpose. Um, and I really start to focus in on aligning um, the things they say are important in their life with the actions they're making every day. Yeah. And, and I'll give you an example, right? Another client I, I dealt with said um, he had had some difficulty growing up as it relates to debt and losing their house. And when I asked her the question, what's most important to you when it comes to your finance, he said security. And he said, I, I just hate debt. And I said, okay, well, how do you pay for, and I listed off a bunch of things today. And he said, well, I pay with credit card. He said, okay, so what message is that sending to your kids about how you feel about debt? The two things aren't aligned, right? So I just try to pull out what they say is important and then show them if their behaviors are aligning with those or not. And that becomes a non-judgmental way yeah. of you know, understanding how do you leverage the things that we need to to create different momentum. So in that situation, he realized credit cards weren't a good thing for him because of what he thought was important and the message he was trying to give to his kids. So right away, he had the realization and started to change his behaviors. So what do you think is the biggest thing in relation to people standing in the way of how they want their financial freedom to be in their lives? What is the biggest thing stopping them from being financially free? Yeah, that's a great question. So what I've found, and I know for myself, right, because for 20 years, I should qualify this, um, despite having a financial background, I made all those mistakes. Mm. And it was through my aha moment with my wife and a conversation with her, I had with her that I was able to actually overcome that and, you know, stop attaching myself to the ego. I think for most people, the problem that they have is that um, they hear so many different messages out there. Mm -hmm. um, like I talked about the things they're doing wrong, but you have to do this, 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 and this. Um, instead of just realizing that, you know, you've made mistakes and it's okay to make mistakes. And if you just accept them and agree to move forward, then you can relieve yourself of that anxiety and start to see that the math behind finance is actually relatively simple. Oh. It's the behaviors that you really need to change. Oh, so how do you get men to stop attaching ego to it? Um, yeah, that's a great question. It, it, again, it goes back to your values, right? And, and most of my clients today are parents. And so as I started this journey myself, one of the things I realized when my wife and I went through the transformation is that I didn't want my kids to make the same mistakes that I did. Mm -hmm. So I have the power right now if I change my behaviors and put some financial values in place that those values will stand the test of time. Whereas maybe some of the messages we got growing up um, didn't stand the test of time because they weren't centered around a holistic view. And so I'll give you some example of those yeah. values, right? So in our household, one of the things that we do is we talk about the things we're going to spend our money on before we, we spend it. Mm -hmm. And that creates this safe environment so that everybody has a say in how we're going to spend our money. And we can make the healthiest decisions in the house as it relates to what that money is going to be used for. So it could be, um, you know, with our kids that we're going to go, so I have three young, young daughters. Um, the oldest is five, the next one's four, and the next one's going to be three next week. So um, when we, I didn't think when I started this that they would really understand it, but I quickly realized they do. And so we'll give them an example where we say today we can do um, one, you know, this one thing, this is going to cost us, $200 or we can do this other thing which is going to cost us 120 what would you guys like to do? And what we found was more times than not, they chose the thing that allowed them to spend time with us versus the thing that, you know, maybe cost more and was, you know, something that seemed remarkable, but it wasn't really what they wanted in the first place. So by involving them in the conversation, we actually started saving money and doing things that everybody wanted. So everybody had a So here's what I, here's where I'm going to probably think that there's going to be some parents resistant to that, that their kids need to be involved with how they spend the money they're earning. So what do you say to people out there who are like, I'm earning the money. Why do my kids get a say in how we as a family spend the money? Yeah, I would have probably already worked with that person and talked about um, their behaviors over the past 15 to 20 years. One thing I'd say, right, it's interesting with finances that most people are reluctant to pay for help with their finances. It's, it's a psychological thing and that they're struggling already. Why would I give up more of my money yeah. 
to try to fix my situation. So yeah, right? normally the people that I'm working with have come to a realization that they need some help, which is the first step, right? right. Um, I needed help, you know, and I sought it in many different places and, you know, through talking to different people and ended up leveraging my own financial background, I was able to create something with my wife so that yeah. it was significantly better. Um, so the people that I'm normally dealing with are ready for that. They're ready to understand where their behaviors come from because in most part, it comes from the money message you got growing up and the money message you get from society that are telling you that it's your money and you should decide on what you should do with it. Uh, what I try to bring them back to is, let's look at some of the things in your past because your experiences are valuable to you. Mm -hmm. Instead of looking at your negative you know, behaviors with money as negative things, I look at that as gifts to you. Lessons learned that you can now leverage to do something different going forward. And, and if you have kids, what were, how would you give those gifts to your kids so that they wouldn't make the same mistakes you did? Mm -hmm. They'd be in a different position when they're 40 years old so that yeah. they wouldn't have to be trying to figure it out then. And so by talking to them that way, they're able to go back and say, okay, the money messages I send to my kids now are going to last a lifetime for them. Right. And the big thing that I learned is that my parents did nothing wrong when it really, you know, when it came to finances and communicating things with us, they did the best they could in the time that they were in. Right. What happened since then is technology and credit and the world of banking totally changed. Mm -hmm. The things they taught us no longer apply today. And that's why I really work hard with clients to come up with values because values are going to stand the test of time as it relates to changes in the economy, changes in credit, and yeah. most importantly, changes in technology. So you've mentioned a few times about money messages when you grew up. Give us some examples of what those look like. So there's going to be people who, you know, who've received those messages, who, who have been living those messages for years and decades and don't even have a clue on what those messages are because that's become their norm. And, you know, they heard it once, they heard it again, they heard it again, and then literally that becomes a norm because they have believed that many message to be truth, right? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And that kind of leads me back to how I started this, this podcast, right? Was that when I go back in time, the money messages that I received from my parents um, were, were, you know, money doesn't grow on trees. Um, we have to work hard. We have to sacrifice so that mm. you know, when you're an adult, you can have more than what we did. Yeah. And then your kids can have more than what you did. So everything that I heard was, from my parents was around scarcity and that there's limited resources as it relates to money and that we have to sacrifice today for the future. And so what happened for me, for example, based on those money messages, when I graduated from, I worked hard, you know, I, I spent my time in college and, and in university and high school, you know, taking on jobs to fund my way through school. And when I graduated, I finally was making that money that I was having um, I finally had more, just like my parents wanted. And what did I do with that? Well, I spent it, right? They wanted me to have more. I'm going to go out and I'm going to buy more. And <laughs> as I did that, what ended up happening was I got into this, this spiral and that the more money that I made, the more money I spent. Right. And then it became the more money I spent, the more money I had to make. So I kept climbing the corporate ladder, trying to um, fund the lifestyle that I thought I was supposed to live. And I never really got ahead. I was, you know, living a life of having more instead of what I try to teach people is living a life of being more. Mm -hmm. And that's really what I want for our kids. And I think every parent does is it's not necessarily about having more in their life. It's about being more and recognizing abundance and living a life of responsibility and happiness. Mm -hmm. And that's what it all comes down to. And it took me 20, 20 years to realize the things that I was looking for were right in front of me all along. Right. And, and, you know, I was looking for how do I have enough money so I can spend time with my family? How do I have enough money so that we can take the trips we want to take? How do I have enough money so that I can retire early? Um, well, then I started taking a step back and saying, I'm working 70 hours a week Ugh. to fund the lifestyle I have. What if I cut some things out of that lifestyle? How much income would I have to make? Ugh. And as a result of that, I was able to change the way I looked at finances for myself and for my family. So what are some kind of key things that people can tune into around their finances in order for them to say, you know what, maybe I need help 
um, because there's going to be people who say, oh, that's not really me, or oh, I don't really identify with that. But what are some kind of red flags that, hey, if this is going on, or hey, if you're thinking this, then you may want to think about getting help, especially because, you know, there's a lot of men out there because it is attached to ego, right? And, and on top of that, because of their fear of asking for help, of it looking like weak, that they don't have all the answers, they should be able to fix these things themselves. What are some red flags that they can say, okay, that, that is me, I, I need to get some help? Yeah, I love that. So, so it's one of the reasons why I wrote the book, first and foremost, is because I knew that there was a lot of people out there that would have a good chance of picking up a book yeah. and exploring it versus reaching out and actually talking to someone and paying money to get help. So I thought, if I can write a book and, and talk about the money messages we receive, talk about the statistics in society, um, show people that their behaviors are normal and a methodology to overcome it, it might be a good tool they can use. But what, what I want to talk about here is that I've really identified three levels of finance. And you know, you can kind of picture yourself to answer your question is that many families are in one of those levels. So the first one is, um, I call it looking for stability. And you're, you know, you're living paycheck to paycheck. Um, no matter what you do, you, you can't get ahead, right? You're struggling actually just to keep up and you find that you're going into more and more debt all the time. There's some critical pieces in your financial picture that aren't in place and you have a ton of anxiety and, and dependence on money. So your income is, is coming in a level where it barely meets or doesn't meet the lifestyle expenses that you've become accustomed to. Okay. Well, that'd be level one. Once it's actually easy to create stability, that's the, the first level to, to find stability in your life. It's actually rather simple. And so I walk people through the steps to do that. There's another group of people at level two, which are, you know, they've got stability. So they've got, let's say, neutral cash flow or a little bit of positive cash flow, but they're still living paycheck to paycheck. They still have that feeling where no matter what I do, I still feel like I'm, you know, just matching my paycheck every couple of weeks or every month. And I just can't seem to get ahead. Mm. Right. And so in, for the people in those scenarios, what I've done is create a, you know, six step process that they can follow to really start to create momentum and start getting improvement as it relates to their finances as a whole. And I recognize, and that's why I call it your income, your life is that your situation could be totally different than someone else's. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of experts out there say you have to follow these steps when in some cases, you know, especially someone who's realizing this, you know, 15 or 20 years after the fact is they've already got some pieces of the puzzle in place. So what I allow people to do in that second step is to fill in the missing puzzle pieces. Mm. Then there's a third level of, of finance, which I call, you know, the, the growth and accumulation phase where you've got stability, you've been able to create momentum and you're improving your situation. Now, how do you really optimize and grow and accumulate well so that you can set yourself up for financial freedom? Does wow. that answer your question? Yeah. So tell us like, what are some, what's like a red flag that they, if they say, you know what, like, is it fear? Is it that, you know, they recognize they're living paycheck to paycheck? Is it that they don't know how they're going to pay for something? Is it um, that they sit there and look back and they have this certain thought that they're like, eh, maybe I need some help around money. What are some um, things that they can, signs that they can kind of be on the lookout for to say, hey, you need to pick up this book or which everyone should probably pick up the book, right? But like that they really need to get help. Yeah, so, so I go back to the methodology then, right? If, if you're living in a way where your income um, is matching the cost of your life or your, your, the cost of your life are exceeding your income and you feel that pressure, that anxiety, that fear, um, that struggle to even keep up, you definitely you know, could benefit by reaching out for help, whether it's a book or um, looking at different avenues out there. Um, if you if you feel like you're not understanding where your finances are going, so you have no clue about what your financial future looks like, you're probably in a situation where you could use to educate yourself as it relates to um, the proper methodology and the things that you have to have in place. Um, for me, what it was, was wanting to put my kids in a position where they were educated on finance. So I felt like 
and this is actually part of my bigger purpose is that I felt like in schools, we get taught nothing about personal finance right. still to this day. And you know, what I want to do is model something different for my kids first and foremost. And then second, I want to actually start educating them on it and influence society to have personal finance as part of the core curriculum in our school. So Ooh, I love that. You gave me yeah, and, and, and it's interesting. Everybody I say that to has a very similar response. You know, I wish they would have taught me that when I was growing up, I wish that would have been in our school system then. And yet today it still isn't, you know, there's a few private schools. There's a few institutions that are doing it, but across the board, it's not even part of the core curriculum. We're learning advanced math techniques, but we're not learning the basic finance uh, principles that will help you in your personal life. So I, I think there's something we need to change there. And if you're feeling that way towards your kids and you have that anxiety about how are they going to be set up for the future? Are they going to live and make the same mistakes you did? Then there's a good chance that it's time to sit down and say, how can we do something differently going forward? Now, you feel the same way about personal finance in the school system as I feel like a class about teaching kids their self-worth. I think that is the number one most important thing that anyone owns is their self-worth. And yet there's absolutely nothing in, in school that, that teaches you about that. And you give that up. It just makes it that much harder to get back. And that is the one thing in your life that will literally affect every decision you make. And so, um, like, you know, and it's as we become older, I think it's like, Oh my gosh, like we, we get taught about history, which I can't tell you the last time I needed to know a history stat of, you know, or a date that something happened, but yet you deal with personal finance, you deal with self-worth every day, and yet you're not taught anything about that. It's like, except for a school of hard knocks, right? When you get out there and, and you struggle with it and yeah, and, and learn the hard lessons. So very, very, very fascinating. Um, so, so let me ask you this, um, you know, as I say that I had this really great thought and it kind of just went out of my head as soon as I was like, oh my God, this really great question I wanted to ask you. And it, oh, I, it just came back to me. So um, in, in a dual household, mom and dad, right? A lot of times one person makes the financial decisions. There's going to be a lot of women out there that literally have no clue on what's going on with their finances. And there are going to be guys out there that maybe have no clue on what goes on in their finances. They bring home the money and then it's like, okay, um, just let the wife deal with it or just let the husband deal with it. What do you say to them? What advice do you give them? Um, and do you believe that both people need to be involved in finances? Yeah, ab absolutely. So let me tell you the story about our, my own personal transformation and why I feel so passionate about this. When I was in that stage of my life where I felt the most anxiety was because I was spending so much time away from my kids. Um, and I finally sat down with my wife and I was stressed in my job and I was stressed about finances at home. And I'm, I'm an accountant and a financial person, right? So I did all the, the finances at home. And I, I said to my wife, I said, you know, I'm really worried about our financial situation. It's causing me a lot of stress. We're spending too much money. I can't figure out how we can get ahead. And I'm worried that uh, my income level is going to drop here in the near future. And she said, well, um, just tell me how much we, we have to spend and I'll limit our budget to that. I have no problem. And so I pulled out our budget, my budget, right? I shouldn't say ours. It was mine, 100% mine. And I couldn't tell her how much money she had available to spend in the month. And she's like, well, I, I just need one number. You tell me how much I have to spend on these things. And I said, well, it's, it's way more compli complicated than that. You just don't understand. And so she actually took my budget in that meeting, in that discussion, and started creating these new categories. Mm. And as a result of that, she's like, okay, here you go. Here's, here's the section. And she created this one section. She said, that's how much I need to know that we have for the month so I can stick to that number each and every month. And I was like, wow, I can't believe that. So here I am, the man the, with the ego, with the financial background, yeah doing all the finances and sitting with my wife, she was able to in like 10 minutes change around our budget in a way that talked to both of us. And that was huge, right? So she actually said in that conversation, we should switch to cash for this section because that's the money we have available. And then we'll know we'll both be on the same page for the month. And I, I fought her on that, right? I said, no, we can't do that. We get points on our credit card. And I had all these reasons in the world about why we couldn't switch to it. And it was a couple months later after going through this process, I was like, let's do it. Let's switch to cash. You know, it's going to be visible to us. We're going to know exactly how we're doing 
yeah. as it relates to our budget without me having to go in and update a spreadsheet every other day. And yeah. so we switched to cash and we went through that process. And through that process, we really started to get on the same page. And I realized that as a team, we were way stronger than one person individually handling their finances. Yeah. And by doing this and creating those values for ourselves, both of us came together to find what was important, you know, what behaviors we needed to align with the things that we said were important. Um, and it actually improved our relationship by leaps and bounds. And when I did research, what I found is, you know, 60% of marriages still to this day um, result in divorce because of money. Yeah. And that's a shame, right? I mean, it, it shouldn't be that way. And especially from what I've seen it do for my family and for many other people that I've worked with is that finances can actually be the catalyst to improve your relationship on so many levels because you learn how to communicate and talk about things because you use money every single day. Yeah, it's right? just about communication, right? Open and Absolutely. honest communication. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, we, I, I joke with people when I start to talk to them, some of them are like, well, if you're going to ask me to manage a budget and look at it every single day, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do all well this process. And no, it's the opposite. Sometimes my wife and I's budget meeting is a text mm. because we're so linked on yeah. you know, that process and we've become so in tune with our finances that we can just communicate. Here's our number for the month. Here's what we've included. We're good to go. Yeah. yeah so it's, it's remarkable. And then, Every day when we have to spend money, we talk about it. And, and we're teaching our kids that it's healthy to talk about spending. Whereas yeah. in most households, it's taboo. And it's also, taboo. if God forbid something should happen to one of the people, or if a divorce happens, the other person isn't left going, I have no idea about anything. They were right there the whole time. Absolutely. It's, it's, it sets both people up for a much better position in the future. Yeah. So tell us one thing that you think people need to know about finances, what they need to do about finances, how they can get started with finances. Like what's one thing that people can start doing today regarding finances? Yeah. So, so one of the things that I found when I went through this was uh, budgeting, right? Every expert out there tells you, you need to create a budget. You need to create a budget. Yeah. But how many people know how to do it? Right. right. What does that mean? So what I say to, to people, the first step, um, obviously, is to admit that you need to do something different. Right. Um, but once you've done that and you've you know, taken the ego out of it and taken security out of it, create a budget together and really understand where you're at today as it relates to your finances. So, you know, the income that you coming, have coming in, how does that relate to the money that's going out to fund your life? If you can create a budget and get on the same page with your spouse or even an accountability partner as it relates to that budget, then you're going to substantially improve your position moving forward because you're going to be aware of how your behaviors impact your financial future. Yeah, and just talk about it, right? Whether it's with a buddy, whether it's with a professional like yourself, but don't just numb yourself and push it down, but give yourself the permission to actually talk about it. Because if you don't talk about it, you're never really going to get the help that you need. You're going to feel like you're the only one going through it and you're all alone. And really you're not like, you know, we've all, we've all had, whether we were young or older, we've all been clueless at some point around our personal finance. So tell us how people can find you, Jeff, and um, the best way to connect with you. Yeah, so you can, you can connect with me through my website, which is uh, yourincomeyourlife.com. Um, you can connect as part of our Facebook community, which is Your Income Your Life community on Facebook. Um, we'd be happy to have you there. And then what I'd like to do, Jessica, for your audience is we'll create a, a separate landing page just for uh, this man thing. Um, we'll call it www.yourincomeyourlife.com backslash this man. And you can go there and get a digital copy of my book for just $4.95. Um, love for people to read it if it changes one person's mind about how they want to have their relationship with money, then that's a, a, a huge success for me. So yeah. love to do that. You can reach out to me by email too at uh, jeff at yourincomeyourlife.com. Love to hear from you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Loved having you on here today, Jeff. Again, I'm Jess Corrector, your host and founder of This Man Thing, where we help men be a truer, better version of themselves, stand in their unique power to gain more freedom, confidence, and success. You can find us at thismanthing.com. You can also join our free Facebook group at thismanthing.com forward slash groups 
where men are having real conversations and building a much needed support and camaraderie with other men. Reach out to me anytime at Jessica at thismanthing.com. And until next time, have a wonderful, amazing, fabulous day. Bye-bye.